are listening to the Slash and Cast Podcast Network. Enjoy the show. <laughs> All right, folks, Justin here with a quick word before we dive in. This episode features myself, Angelique, Nick, and Henry, and we chat with author and actress Barbie Wilde, whom you may know as the female Cenobite from Hellraiser 2. We chat about fiction, Rod Serling, sci fi, serial killers, Hellraiser, of course, music, and much more. So without further ado, here you go. Greetings, boils and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> Barbie, how you doing? I'm fine, considering the horrific circumstances in which we've all been living in the last, it hasn't been 15 months or something, but my anxiety levels are high at the best of times. So this isn't been great, but this is, the, those anxiety levels are things that I use when I do my aura writing, because I think, okay, if I'm going to be killing somebody, I want to make sure I get away with it. And how would I do that? So I always sort of catastrophize ahead of time to figure out how I can not get caught by something. Not that I would really want to kill someone someone i'd like to point out <laughs> oh, there were a few people no i'm only kidding some, some let, people uh, in mind we say allegedly yeah <laughs> exactly but no it's interesting because i remember reading alfred hitchcock say that his greatest fear was the hand of authority on his shoulder or something and he he was a kind of fearful person and that's why he was so brilliant at doing these amazing movies with suspense and horror and stuff like that there's a film that i highly recommend Recommend called Hitchcock just watched it again a couple of days ago about the making of Psycho which to me is the best serial killer movie ever made followed closely by American Psycho directed by a woman and you know it's just nobody wanted him to make no one wanted him to make that movie he had so much against him and I really recommend it if any of you guys are into the thought of doing stuff writing stuff directing stuff watch Hitchcock because he just come off of North by Northwest you know and they still didn't want him to make that movie is that a reason and- documentary no no it's starring anthony hopkins uh, hitchcock and alma revel is played by the scintillating and my personal girl crush helen mirren and it's uh. got scarlett johansson playing janet lee and she's uncanny she really captures everything about janet lee so no it's about oh god how old is it oh it may be like 10 years old or something like that but I've it's available arrived. We bought it because it's so inspiring because, like I said, nobody wanted him to make that film. Am I rambling on about stuff? Sorry. You're you're doing what you're supposed to do. That's the podcast. You've given us a little insight, Barbie, with your Dark Shadow story. So take us back in time a little. What other sort of films, books, and stuff were you into when you were younger? That sort of when I was younger, it was it was definitely Dark Shadows. And then I took a course in Gothic literature in my senior year in high school, and I read all of this Gothic literature, like Frankenstein, Dracula. Up until then, I was a big Sherlock Holmes fan. That was it. I just read those stories over and over and over again, which of course is a perfect almost police procedural kind of thing if you want to get into that because I was originally interested in writing crime novels and then when I was trying to get the Venus complex off the ground because it was a novel about a serial killer told from his viewpoint they said oh uh, somebody said oh try this horror publisher called Comet Press now Red Room Press I said well it's not horror it's crime really and they said well actually it's dark crime it's so dark that that's what they would like that so I did it and they, they accepted the book for publishing which is wonderful but but Dracula really rocked my boat. I love that. Also because it's in a diary format, which is sort of what I'm echoing in, in the Venus complex. What other things? Oh, and I get to blame my big brother yet all over again because he would make me watch Saturday afternoon creature feature every Friday freaking Saturday. I'm like, you know, four years younger than him. I'm like eight and he's 12. And he's like, oh, well, this is so cool. Let's watch the thing from another world. Ah! 
you know. <laughs> and that moment when James Arness's fingernails are cut off in the door still haunts me. And of course, the perfect one, the ones that really fed my paranoia. And as we all know, this is a quote from a movie. Paranoia is just life on a uh, is just reality on a finer scale. Is the invasion of the body snatchers, where you have parents putting pods underneath the baby's crib so the alien pods can take over the children. That's horrible. And then the original invaders from Mars, where this kid watches, he sees this flying saucer land, and his father gets sucked under, and he comes back, and he's got something drilled in his neck or something, and he becomes controlled by the aliens. So that made me. I didn't. I love. Of my parents, but I always looked under the bed for pods every morning, every night in the closet for the boogeyman in the bed for spiders. That was my ritual. And every time my dad went downstairs to read his science fiction novels, which he would do a lot during the summertime because it was cool down there, I would check the back of his neck to make sure he hadn't been drilled by Martians. Better safe than sorry. Yes. And one time I told him years later and he went, I always wondered why you grabbed the back of my shirt when I came up from the basement because I was so small and I would grab it to see if I could see the back of his neck. This sounds like I'm a really weird, creepy kid, doesn't it? But hey. like, like the line of the song, you know, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean that they're not after you. Out to get you. No, but I actually, in my collection of short horror stories, which at the moment, sadly, has gone out of print, it had a very lovely run of five years, and every story was illustrated by a top artist in the horror genre, including Clive Barker allowed me the use of three of his paintings in the book. But I wrote a story called Bada Folk and it's based on invaders from Mars and it's all it's you know my basement ugh, you know which I always thought was really creepy I couldn't understand why my father and my mother used to go down there to do her little drawing bits and stuff it was the creepiest basement in the world I still have nightmares and there was a secret room in the basement that we weren't allowed to go into mm-hmm. and one day the door was opened and the only thing left in there was a tiny little Victorian baby carriage Whoa. that was you know a child's toy and that features in the story because I still I walked in and saw that and went that's the creepiest freaking thing I've ever seen I was such a wimp I was scared by baby carriages when I was a child but I think it was just the an overactive imagination that's my excuse and I'm sticking to it secret room I think you should have checked your dad's neck a little closer yep (laughs) (laughs) there you know were your parents creative at all? At all? You said your mother did art and your, your she, dad was a science fiction fan. Most of the horror that I saw, you may have noticed from the films that I just said, were science fiction horror. My father mm-hmm. was obsessed by it and he had boxes and boxes of analog and science, you know, from the 40s and the 50s, it'd be worth a fortune now. But, you know, sadly, I think she who should not be named, not my mother, but the one who came after, and I won't mention any names, probably eBayed them or something like that. But he had sent, uh, you know, all the original novels and books from Who Goes There, which was the basis of the thing from outer space. And then, of course, Carpenter's thing, which was a brilliant adaptation of that. He just had boxes, and bo- he never took them out of the boxes. He had a library, huge bookcases upstairs, where he had Winston Churchill proper books although that's respectable stuff (laughs) the respectable stuff but all the paperbacks and the magazines were in these boxes of course upstairs is where I found Rosemary's baby which I don't think he mentioned to my mother that he he bought so that was you know just the covers alone wildly squidgy monsters half clad females screaming and brave astronauts with ray guns shooting at them I mean it was just like whoa It it was wonderful stuff my brother then started to sort of hear read this you know and I started reading John Carter of Mars which is wonderfully I mean they made a terrible movie of it but they actually and Tarzan of the Apes and all the Edgar Rice Burroughs books I'll never okay here's a memory for you I just finished reading a couple of John Carter books and they were kind of racy for the time Mm -hmm. I think you wrote them in the 20s or 30s and I I lined up all my little dolls and I put a pink kerchief over my lamp and I said mommy mommy come in here and watch this you have to see this she came in and she saw all the dolls lined up and she said, what, what is this about? And she went, I've made a bordello, mommy. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. You know, she screamed my, 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 my brother's name. What have you been giving your sister to read? <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but it's too late by then. You know, she was trying to get me interested in Rebecca of Sunny Book Farm or whatever damn thing. And I was already going, eh, leave me with my John Carter Mars and <laughs> Modelos great. and red skinned, dusky, prin- you know, princesses and stuff. So my father was actually a chemical and electrical engineer, but he sort of had the brain the size of a planet, obviously with a double degree. He, but like I said, his interests were absolutely very literary and watching. He, they they were very sort of grown up and we watch movies. When I was fairly young, I think I saw Psycho on TV. Oh, it's nine o'clock, time for Saturday Night at the Movies. What's on TV <laughs> this week? You know, a friend of mine, Tim Dry, who was, he played the monster in Extra. Did you guys ever see Extra? Oh yeah, Extra. I've yeah. seen Extra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He The first video nasty. And he was also in Star Wars, but his mom took him to see Psycho when he was 12. Oh, that nice Mr. Hitchcock. He did North Northwest, darling. This is his new movie. Let's go and see it. And so he was like going, ah, oh, yeah. So that's it. They just sort of basically thought I was sensible enough to not get scared to death watching <laughs> the birds, you know. It's like, oh, what? The birds taken over on that. So, yes, I had a pretty good, quite conservative, really, I suppose, politically. But they were very much of the, oh, well, if it's on Saturday night at the movies, it must be okay. <laughs> I see that you studied classical mime. So how did that interest come about? Okay. <laughs> okay. I was basically born in Canada, raised in the United States, and I was having trouble at university. My parents wanted me to stay in university. I wanted to get out there. And I thought, oh, so, uh, what am I going to do here? And if my friend Bonnie came back from a London program that my university was doing, and she said, you got to do it. It's fabulous. So I, I thought, I said, listen, I'll go back to school, but maybe you know just kickstart it because I'd actually gone and worked for a theater instead of my second year at university doing being a stage manager and stuff and uh, I said to my listen why I'll make you a deal I'll go back to school but can I go to London and it wasn't that more expensive I mean you just have to pay thing and then just you know send me a few pounds a week or something so I got there and she's my friend said you must check out this thing called the dance center in Covent Garden and I looked there and she had taken mime classes so I thought oh I'll take mime classes it's funny enough I'm the first person I met basically was who became my boyfriend was my friend Tim he's now a friend and he was in this group called silence and after about six months the leader of the group said do you want to join because somebody else was missing at least missing <laughs> they got missing they couldn't stand <laughs> <in> mine anymore <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but it was sorry if this is going on too long but that's how I got into doing mime and we were the largest mime company in Britain and we did a one week residency at the Arts Theatre Club and Marcel Marceau himself came to see us wow uh, yeah and then you know through that we started doing like little cabaret bits and then somebody Tim and our other guy in the group shock that I went to after silence we were a music mime dance group and they sort of started doing robotic mime as I did, you know, just sort of did a huge amount of touring, shocked it supported Gary Newman at Wembley in front of 13,000 people a night or whatever. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, no, it was brilliant. And we did all the mime stuff, but I also did the dance stuff. So there were two, da- three dancers, two mimes, and I was a mime dancer. And then we ended up getting signed to RCA Records, released a couple singles, and then we spectacularly broke up on stage at the Lyceum, supporting Grace Jones or some damn thing. I don't know. No, we didn't support Grace Jones, but we also supported Ultravox and Depeche Mode before they were Depeche Mode. Then we just broke up and I just said, oh, well. But the the funny thing about the mime is, in a little connection, is that Clive Barker was fascinated by mime and you can see pictures of him in mime makeup. And I think that helped me get the part in Hellbound because for some reason, I don't know, and I actually went up for, as a mime artist, went up for one of the apes in Greystoke. That would have been fun. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, let's wear this big furry suit with mechanical <laughs> things on your face in Kenya with 100 degree heat. No, I don't think so. Glad I didn't get that. There was the, the received wisdom was that Stanley Kubrick used mime artists as their, the apes in 2001 because supposedly they're more patient <laughs> <laughs> or something. Or they, they, they also have the, the idea of being still. Dancers, the whole thing is movement, movement, movement. But with mime artists, it is the perfection of the art is to keep as still as possible. And of course, the Cenobite thing is we don't run through forests scaring girls with knives. We just are there and we just have a presence. So I think that might have been one of the reasons why 
I got the part. So I thought that was very helpful. Were you a, a fan of Clive Barker's work before you got into the second film? Have you had you read his fiction or seen the first Hellraiser? I hadn't. I don't think I'd read his. Oh God, I'm trying to remember. I don't think I did. I did go and see Hellraiser because there was such a big buzz about it in England at the time because because it was like he is the face of horror and Stephen King had given it this great blurb and mm-hmm. I thought, gosh, and I have read obviously since then I've read a lot of, of Clive and I think Hell Hellbound the Hellbound Heart in particular is absolutely brilliant. You know, Weave World and all the other things is fantastic stuff. Mm-hmm. But you know, we just had to go and see it because you know, especially being actors and stuff. He's the new face of horror. Although, to be honest, I've always been very picky about the horror I've seen. I mean, I prefer sci-fi horror like Alien. That to me is like the sort of ultimate. But we went to see it and I just thought, oh my God, this is like, I think one of the suggestions for the title, because they didn't want to use the Hellbound Heart because they thought it might be sound too romantic. And some bright spark at the, the American distribution company said, why did you call it sadomasochists from hell? The funny thing is, of course, is that the Cenobites were this bright brand new kind of monster, but I actually found them pretty terrifying. So when I got the call to do the audition, I nearly didn't go because I thought they wanted me to play the chatterer. And I thought that was just yuck. Uh, <laughs> no, in a good way. I mean, it's yeah. even so yeah. scary, you know, but also I hated mask work. I'd done a commercial once for Godly and Cream, choreographed by Bruno Tonioli of Strictly Come Dancing fame. I think you guys probably know him. And I had to be a robotic woman tangoing and I had this horrible mask mask on and nearly died of the fumes and I thought oh god can when they said no no it's for the female cinema oh okay that's fine and so you know but that that was I nearly didn't go because Hellraiser disturbed me so much it was a very very effective brilliant film it was four hours for makeup and having stuff glued to my face I learned a lot about the process though because they used a medical adhesive that had been developed during the Vietnam War as a field dressing because when you go in people are being shot up and helicopter Helicopters are whirling and, you know, they have these gaping wounds and they would just put their hands together and then pour this medical adhesive in and it would close the wound. And so that's what they glued onto my face and they took it off with some horrible adhesive removing thing that I used to, I had to go and have so many facials after this film. So it was four hours in makeup, in the makeup chair, and then a half an hour in costume. I got off lucky. Ken Cranham was there for six hours. Doug, I think was six hours because all those pins and also the painting of the, you know, the prosthetic pieces of white, and then they have to paint it every day and taking all the stuff off took an hour it was pretty grueling and and some people are made for that and so would you do it again and i think well if they've got like some super fast way of doing it you know that that might be a thing i think doug actually got it down his makeup artist for hellraiser 3 oh god i can't remember his name gary tunnicliffe oh, he did it in an hour doug had a, a wager with him wow which has got to be some kind of record yeah, that's impressive yeah and i think it didn't take six hours when tom savini did oh. doug's makeup for this special thing he did, the Hellraiser experience that he did at Mad Monster Party in Tucson a few years ago, where he actually appeared as Pinhead. And you got to, to be filmed with him and he would do a scene with you in the special room, which is like, wow. People were like, oh my God, I can't believe it. So that's basically how long it took. And I think filming was two or three weeks. I can't, I can't quite remember how long it took to actually do my little bits. I mean, when you add them up, they're not a lot. They're memorable though. I think one of the funniest things that came out is that of course in America they, they actually had taken some photographs when we were all set on set wearing these surgeon masks and outfits but it wasn't in the movie and everyone said oh no this scene must have been so horrific they cut it from the movie and it became legend and then and Doug and I said ah we never filmed it because we got on set had the outfits on and some bright spark realized that what they wanted to do would take another 50,000 pounds of effects to do and it was a low budget film so we scrapped it. Doug and I have been saying this for years and then a couple years ago for one of the Blu-ray releases all this footage popped up of me and Doug being filmed. We were slips. Uh, we did film it but it wasn't you know it, wasn't, it didn't add anything to it we couldn't do the transformation so I guess that's why they didn't put it in but it's weird that two people would have the same memory of not doing any filming we just took photographs. Barbie I'm looking at your credits and it looks like you hosted a lot of shorts in the 80s like the American Hot 100 This is of course before I did the horror thing i had funny colored hair and i was, I, 
actually, how did I get that? Again, I, oh, my, my agent just set me up for stuff. He said, what do you, would you be interested in hosting TV shows? And these are program, you know, not shorts, but TV shows. Mm. And I said, I'd love to. Always interested. At, at the same time, I had a parallel music career. I was trying to, obviously, like I said, we released a few albums and it's singles sorry and i'd done a couple of tracks with the produ- a producer a friend of mine and stuff so i was still you know so i was very interested in the music scene so i did the american hot 100 with a dj called pat sharp and we worked well together and then we did something else where i interviewed the sisters of mercy to be somerville i can't remember and then <laughs> And then, you know, that proceeded along along with the acting career. And then I did a TV show called Cool Tight, which was a children's show. And on that, I interviewed Iggy Pop and the B-52s. And uh, they were all just adorable and really good sports. You know, it's, it's sort of Britain's Elvis, Cliff Richard, and oh, and Johnny Lydon from the, the Sex Pistols. Mm-hmm. Johnny Rotten. That was just hysterical. And it was, it was really, he was great. He was really fantastic. So so funny, so professional, and in a weird way, you know. <laughs> but he was, he was, he did everything we asked him to do, and it was all great. So I, I really felt more comfortable in many ways being myself interviewing people. And then I did have a TV show reviewing films, and I reviewed Hellraiser, Hellraiser One or Hellraiser Two, and gave away one of my crew T-shirts as a prize, and, and interviewed Nick, uh, not Nicholas Cage, that was a different one, but I interviewed Hugh Grant oh. when he was a baby. <laughs> he was so unresponsive i said are you half asleep I didn't say Wake up. You know, and so you're part of the british rat pack or no i'm not you know rat pack. oh he hated me <laughs> oh no but i'd love him now i mean he's great you know so um anyway so that was that was great and then in between those bits i mean i was actually doing my video review film video release review program the same time i was doing filming hellbound which was interesting it was the other thing oh and i did Death Wish 3 in a couple years before that. And then a couple years before that, I did Grizzly 2, which had just been re-released. They'd finally finished it after 27 years or something. And it's got baby performances by Charlie Sheen, George Clooney, Laura Dern. They were just like little babies. And they get killed by the bear almost immediately. <laughs> but, um, there was a lot of interest in the film because of that. But they, and sadly, most of my bits landed up on the, the cutting room floor as... <laughs> they often do. <laughs> no, no, this only happened to me twice. Happened to David Niven. And the first film he was ever in, he, they actually replaced him, which is even more embarrassing than ending up on the cutting room floor. Did I ever answer your question? <laughs> I'd, I'd say you did. Barbie, I got to ask you for a look behind the curtain here because you also were a casting director on The Real World. Yes. Do you just go looking for the craziest people you can find? How does that work? I just sat in my little airless office and I had <laughs> minions go running through Covent Garden. He said, look for interesting young people. So that's what happened. Of course, we also put ads. One of the girls was a, that I picked was a model in Paris. And she did this brilliant little film of her walking through the streets of Paris for an audition. And she was Australian and she was gorgeous and so funny. We got her in and she she got it. And now she's married to the guy who is the lead in Suits. I thought, oh, wow, I launched her. Not really. I mean, she would <laughs> it anyway. She's wonderful. Now, Suits is quite good, actually. It had a sort of princess in it now, Meghan Markle. But anyway, and who else was in it? I, you know, I just, they, we had to choose a couple of Americans and then we had an American team doing that. Picked somebody who was a guy who was going to Oxford because they wanted somebody a bit posh. Mm. And this lovely gal called Sharon, who was a singer and a you know musician. She was fantastic. But it was great fun, but I it was very stressful. I used to come home and just sort of like, oh my God. And I'd hear this this cocktail shaker going. <laughs> My partner is primo at making great cocktails, and I'd get home at 10 o'clock at night. I mean, it was like the casting process was quite arduous. So, you know, in the end, it was great, and it was a very good show, I think, Real World London. No, I mean, for better or for worse, the real world kind of started the whole reality TV thing. And for that... We should not be grateful. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also at the same time, though, you gave voices to a lot of subject matters that were affecting teenagers and young adults at the time. So, you know, there's a lot to applaud about that because oh, I think sure. uh, the real world, not necessarily the real world London, from what I remember, but I know that it brought the AIDS epidemic 
kind of to the San front centers. So oh, I watched that series because they wanted me to see that particular one. And it was it was brilliantly done. I was only kidding when I said that. I think there was one other one that at the same time, it was Big Brother. And mm-hmm. then it became Celebrity Big Brother and stuff like that. But I do have a tendency to avoid that kind of program. You know, like I haven't seen Kicking Up with the Kardashians or whatever it's called. You know, it's like, don't. I, um, don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Some things are best left to Fantasy Island or I'm going to bonk this guy because right. and I don't even know who he is for TV. And it's just, I think, really, you know, it's just, it's it's like, and I probably sound like this little old grumpy lady. Like sometimes, <laughs> what's the inf- thing you guys say in America? It's like too much information. EMI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, though, it's it's like anything else. It seems like Hollywood now, like all of your innovative and groundbreaking material, they're trying to remake and repolish and retool and they just can't recapture the, the charm of, of those films or TV series. So I guess they go to the, the way of the dodo in some ways. As Doug says so eloquently on one of his t-shirts, no more remakes, please. It's a waste of good celluloid. And <laughs> I, I love that. I love that. And so every time I hear they're going to re I mean, when if there was one little moment when J-Lo, no, yeah, J-Lo and Ben Affleck were going to remake Casablanca. Ooh. Now, I don't know if you guys have seen, I know a oh, lot yeah, of it's... people don't, don't watch Casablanca. They Thanks, haven't seen it. So that is a sacred movie. There is no need. A yet another pointless remake why remake something and then why those two i mean ben's a good actor i guess i mean he, he did that wonderful one the accountant i thought he was very good in that and argo you know brilliant j-lo can't think exactly the last thing i particularly liked her in but it's sort of like it's like it's an ego project mm-hmm. you know you dare touch this classic and it's sort of like someone saying oh i'm gonna remake citizen kane be brilliant i'm waiting for the remake of ben hur that's what i need to see on the big oh. screen <laughs> well funnily enough funnily enough all these films that we love so much right ben hur was a remake there was a silent version. And so was the Maltese Falcon. I think that was, again, see, you might have said, I love black and white movies. Not just black and white, but film noir, you know, Humphrey, anything with Humphrey Bogart or Robert Mitchum. You know, they're just brilliant movies and they're directed by wonderful directors. I mean, I love Hitchcock. He's like one of my top faves. You know, oh God, there was this benighted remake of Psycho. Did you remember that? I was just going to ask you about that, the shot for shot remake. <laughs> <laughs> Except for the cow. You know, poor old Arbogast is being stabbed on the stairs and this the cow cow pops into his head. What? Why? <laughs> Uh, you know, I can't, uh, bless him, you know, more power to his elbow. I can't remember his name, but that to me was just the most benighted, ghastly project. And I feel terribly sorry for all actors involved because they think, hey, this is cool. It's like, uh, maybe you shouldn't get to thing, but, you know, you see actors say, hey, wow, this might launch my career or it'll sustain it or I'll be known for this, you know, and nope, <laughs> down the toilet and you know, luckily, <laughs> Anne Hesh and oh, I love that the the guy who played Norman Bates. He's a really good actor. I think it Vince was Vaughn. Vince, Vince Vaughn. I love Vince Vaughn. He's great. Who played uh, the John Gavin part? I can't remember. Vigo Mortensen. <gasps> Vigo. Yes, it was Vigo, That's- and that was the only reason I watched it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. just took the words out of my mouth you know oh, i yeah. think that that's why i watched it because vigo can do no wrong except doing the remake of psycho funnily enough just watched him in a true life horror story again because we love this film is eastern promises where he Ooh. plays well an undercover cronenberg oh, just fantastic. that film is fantastic uh, also you get to see a lot of vigo in that movie <laughs> Maybe you get to see a lot of Vigo in the movie. Oh, yeah. Woo! I'm, so, I'm really worried for him in that sort of steam room scene. You know, Jesus, the guy's got a knife. <laughs> right. uh, so I meant to ask Barbie, what is your favorite version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers? 
Ah. Funnily enough, because I'm still working on this, it's a, a project in, it's very difficult to make movies at the moment. I'm working on a project with Chris Alexander, who is the former editor-in-chief of Fangoria. And he's done a lot of wonderful films called Blood for Irina, all this kind of stuff. And we were talking about the films, and he's interviewed me for Get Fangoria, the films that, that sort of made us. And I mentioned Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And he immediately assumed I meant the seven, 70s, right? The Donald Sutherland version, right? <laughs> Which I remember going and seeing. And I started watching it again. And I thought, something's going to happen. And I remember how it ends and all this kind of stuff. And I love Donald Sutherland beyond measure. He's in a really great horror movie called... Don't look at Oh, thank you. That's it. Brilliant movie. I've always looked very suspiciously in short pe- at short people in little red coats ever since <laughs> they moved. Yeah. I mean, um, you, literally, you literally mentioned that in the Venus Complex. Did I? Oh, yes, I did. Yeah, yeah, did. <laughs> hey. But that, I thought, oh, God, but that black and white version, God, who's it directed by? Oh, Don Siegel. Yep. And went on to do some, a lot of work with Clint Eastwood, of course. That's the one that scared the poop out of me. And I don't care <laughs> if the pods look like they were made of paper mache or not. You're talking to a Star Trek, the original series girl, paper mache rocks and pods. That was oh, part of, you know. You're um, after my own heart, I have yeah. to say. Well, no, I, I love the next generation. And yes, when, when Patrick Stewart was voted sexiest man in America or something, I went, yes. I actually saw him in a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, where he played Oberon. And the only thing he was wearing was a mohawk hairdo and a thong thing. He did supposedly him and um, oh Ian McKellen. Mm-hmm. They did a rendition of Waiting for Godot. Yeah. And it may be one of the most powerful renditions I've ever seen. But is it on film? I think there's still YouTube videos. I think someone has. I, it's probably bootleg more than likely, oh, but God. they filmed them. I didn't realize it was on film. I would love to see that because I really write in. I think Ian McKellen is absolutely adorable. He did a very weird version of Macbeth. No, Richard the Third. Sorry, which I didn't particularly like. He sort of set it. You know, they were all wearing Nazi uniforms and there were tanks everywhere and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I'm a bit of a traditional when it comes to my Shakespeare. The best Macbeth I ever saw was John Finch in Roman Polanski's Macbeth. That was really weird and strange and interesting. But no, I mean, I think that, you know, he's a wonderful actor and I love uh, second generation, next generation. But to me, there's a magic in the first one. And I mean, they preserve the moral core of all the stories in the second one. Listen to me. The narrative arc. But I think the first one has a special magic. Also, I was coming of age when it came out and my father was so excited because he went, they've got the best sci-fi writers, Isaac Asimov and all these people writing episodes. And, you know, I had a crush on William Shatner because he had amazing shoulders and a tight bum. And I had a crush on Mr. Spock because he was an intellectual. And I adored Dr. McCoy because he was funny and sort of he didn't like his atoms scattered all over the universe every time he went into transport. Oh, I think I think Bones might be my Star Trek crush. He's he's <laughs> he's the dry he's the dry humor we all need in our oh, lives. I think it's Carl Urban Urban played him in the movie. Yeah. And he did such a great job. They they did the remake with Chris Pine and mm-hmm. Zachary Quinto. I have to say we watched it on DVD and the the menu came up and it was just this, the schematics of the enterprise came up and I burst into tears. Oh, that's how geeky I am. I was at work when uh, the word came up that Leonard Nimoy had passed and I was actually supervising the call floor, walking amongst my agents and somebody said, hey, Angelique, Spock just died. And I stopped right there and I just, I wept. Oh, and three days, <laughs> oh. three days it took me. <laughs> I actually put him, you know, doing his sign, you know, as my cover photograph. It was very, very upsetting because I totally adored him. And there's this wonderful article that came out just during the Star Trek times that said that his character helped people who were like outsiders. A society, as I, I don't know how you guys handled high school. You know, I was luckily I was totally ignored instead of beaten up like a lot of my fellow actor friends. It, it made you feel he's an outsider. He's an alien on this spacecraft and yet you will and always will be my friend <laughs> that is the i watched that scene on uh in in the second movie Raphicon, and i hate to admit but i tear up every time because it's such a listen i do apologize i am feeling a bit emotional at the moment this is a very stressful i've got all this other reality shit happening and that's my excuse for tearing up a bit at spock's death in the <laughs> second film because no um, excuse, no excuse needed That'll break any. Thank you. Thank you. 
No, but it, it was absolutely such a powerful moment. They were filled with powerful moments. You know, the city on the edge of forever. Yeah, that's a, t- with Joan Collins, right? Is it the city on the edge of tomorrow or the city on the edge of forever? Is that uh, uh, that's the Ellison story, right? Yeah, Harlan Ellison. Yeah. Edge of tomorrow, I think, isn't it? Edge of forever. Yeah, it's the edge of forever. Okay. Oh, thank you. No, Edge of Tomorrow is a film which is brilliant with Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt. And there's this alien invasion and it keeps on repeating itself. It's brilliant. Mm-hmm. It's this like loop time loop thing, which is like one of my favorite next generation episodes, cause and effect. Sorry. I think we're deeply, deeply, deeply falling into Star Trek. It's fine. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> it's a Star I, uh, Trek podcast now. We, we need to have you on again, and we'll just talk Star Trek for two hours. It'll be great. Well, also, by the way, it has a breakthrough in so many things just before we go. And funnily enough, there's my other favorite TV series. Absolutely was an enormous influence on me and written by I would, one of my favorite writers. My favorite writers are Clive Barker, Patricia Highsmith, Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, Ramsey Campbell, friend Paul Kane, my other friend, Tim Dry, but Rod Serling is one of my favorite writers. And so many of the actors in Star Trek appeared, of course, in Twilight Zone. Notoriously, you know, terror at whatever is horror at 30,000 feet with Bill Shatner looking out the window and, oh my God, what's that? You know, on the plane, you know, and it's just, it's, it's interesting that... With the Twilight Zone and Star Trek, you had a time period where you had a space where you could philosophically look at situations and you could present people for the first time viewpoints of reality that or just moral conundrums that they would normally never deal with in their everyday life kind of larger implications and sterling was there are plenty of people that worship him but he still very much is the unsung hero of modern horror and science fiction and weird fiction and it's um it's fantastic that his works still are trying to be emulated today, but no one will match him. I utterly agree. I think that I was very fortunate. Like I said, my parents just, you know, my father loved Twilight Zone. We would have dinner precisely at six o'clock. And then at seven o'clock, we would watch an episode of Twilight Zone every day. It was on high rotation. I, I think this is, you know, they did the repeats and stuff like that or, or reruns. And it was, you know, some of them scared the poop out of me. Like I said, I was quite young. There's one called Little Girl Lost. Do you remember that episode? Oh, These yeah. parents hear their child crying and they go into the bedroom and she's not there. And there's this line on the wall and she, she's gone into another dimension. And they call their next door neighbor, who just happens to be a physicist. And he comes over and goes, Jesus, this is some weird shit. And they manage to call <laughs> the dog is in there with it. And they call mm-hmm. the dog, and, hold on to the dog, Kathy. And she comes back, you know, it's all weird in here. And that, um, that episode father- is so ahead of its time because like that whole plot is echoed later in Poltergeist. Exactly. And that one moment when the, the neighbor is going, you got to get her, grab her, come through mm-hmm. because the thing was actually narrowing. And they managed to pull them all through just in time but it's just it was it you know i mean you can imagine though if you're eight years old and there is no horror like we have now i mean when i'm at conventions then i have kids coming up and go well you scared me to death when i was eight and i just go what were your parents thinking of you know? <laughs> There's S and M sex sound. I mean, you know, Julia is whoa. Although she is a bit of a unsupervised. I hope so. No, but of course, I mean, one little girl came up to me and she'd made this little Cenobite doll. I said, "Do your dad let you watch this?" And she and he was right there. And he said, "I was teaching her about special effects. I'm a special effects artist. I'm duly chastised." But I still think, you know, I was traumatized by paper mache pods. God, that's what kids wandering around now are traumatized by. I don't know. I mean, it's, it is one of those things. You just, I like I've said, do people say, oh, you know, do you think horror films, you know, affect people, make people run amok and stuff? I go, no, because I, my brother and I watched tons of that stuff when we were kids. And, you know, he's a college professor so, <laughs> and I'm a, and a, an actress. So we managed to survive it. It just kept, we have great, hold on. Can you just hold on a bit? We need to touch base on your, on your novel uh, a little bit. Is this your, this is your first full novel, right? You've, you've written a lot of short stories, but this is your first yeah. novel. Yeah, it's the so- Venus Complex. It's the Diary of a Serial Killer. I was always fascinated fascinated by serial killers. I read a book by Colin Wilson called The Order of the Assassin when I was like 22 or something. Whoa, what's this shit about? There are people like doing this? I had never heard of serial killers. You have to understand this was in the 
the late 70s. Now media, internet stuff, you know, movies even. Like I said, when you think about the 70s, can't rem- think of any or the, you know, there's there's Psycho and there are a few other ones, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But um, no, no, I was absolutely sort of fascinated because I'm so not a serial killer. You know, I'm very empathic. I worry about what people think. I don't know. But then there are these characters who are like psychopaths and they don't care. They do things for their own pleasure and it doesn't matter. And I just thought, wow, that's really an interesting idea. And then I had a friend. She was the one who inspired me. She was had a, a degree in human sexuality. She was trying to get her a master's. She had a master's in human sexuality, trying to get a master's in forensic psychology or a degree. And she was also dominatrix and one of the most notorious in New York, actually. And she she helped me a lot with research because she knew some policemen who who loved her and not that they were clients or anything, but talked to them. And I was able to, you know, she took me to a concert because she was a member of the American Society of Sexual Therapists. And she took me to conventions of psychologists and stuff, which was really interesting. And I learned a lot. Uh, But she said, one of my biggest fantasies is to sleep with a serial killer. And I just went, that's so sick. And then I had a dream that night and I woke up and I went, I've been thinking about writing a book for ages. And I thought that's the book. And for a year, I worked on the book from the viewpoint of the plucky forensic psychologist. And then I went, Every, the people have done this before. So I thought, I want to get into this guy's head. And it was a difficult, took me a long time to write. I was actually interviewed by a horror blogger. And it turns out he's a policeman. And I said, what did you think about the procedural and all that? And he said, you absolutely got it spot on, which I think is one of the highest compliments I ever got on the book. Because, But it's not only just a book about a guy who's running around killing people. It's he's he's very art. He's an art history professor. He's he's got issues with his ex-wife and he's got thoughts about media and stuff like that, which I think are very funny, to be honest. But the opinions of my serial killer are not necessarily those of myself. But <laughs> got to say so that, that, you know, I, I w- also wanted to explore his sexual mindscape you know what do these people fantasize about and is this you know you could say oh is it like a fantasy like american psycho might have been a fantasy you know who knows and people want to have see a, a sequel and stuff but i think the like, greatest compliment is i gave the book to my friend steph who is partner of doug bradley pinhead from hellraiser and she says oh barbie i don't really i love reading about serial kills i'm fascinated by them but i don't read fiction i just read nonfiction." i said listen I really did my research and I love your opinion on it. And the next time I saw them at a convention, they came up and she said, well, Doug read me your book because she's a sculptress. And so he was reading it to her and I went, oh my God, I'd love to hear Doug read the Venus complex. And Doug said in his wonderful way, we must talk about that. And so he ended up doing the audio book and we worked together again after all these years. And it was delightful because I was sort of like, he was like, well, how should I do that? We made all these decisions. We worked together. I was sort of directing him a little bit, not that he needs it because he's Mr. Audiobook, really. He's uh, Guillermo de Toro he said he was brilliant. That was a delightful thing. And it sort of opened up the book in such a new way. I could really hear it, see it in my mind's eye as a movie, which I've always wanted to do. So that was that was really, a, you know, a great accolade that he wanted to to do it. And I still want to write, you know, it's sort of like how much do I want to continue Michael's story? Oh no, spoiler, he survived. <laughs> Whoops. But they all do. I mean, you the amount of s- serial killers that get caught are not that many. But interestingly, now they actually caught the Green River killer recently because of DNA. Mm-hmm. I think they caught him in Spokane, Washington, or someplace bizarre yeah. like that. And I think yeah. he's on. He's on death's bed, pretty much. Like, he's bound in a wheelchair. It's great that they caught him, but I don't, I don't know not, whether... Essentially. Yeah. It's interesting because um, Ed Kempler, a friend of mine, interviewed him. And I thought, why did you ever tell me you interviewed Ed? And he's, he was the guy who killed a few, killed some university students and then finally killed the person he really wanted to kill, his mother, and threw her voice box in the garburator. Anyway, he, he I think he turned himself over to the police and he went to yeah, jail. Yeah, yeah he literally he, called the cops and said, come get me. <laughs> yeah, but he's featured in, I think it was called Manhunter, 
The first, uh, that brilliant. David, David Fincher, he can do it. In, in Mindhunter, oh my God, the, the guy yeah. that plays him in Mindhunter is absolutely fantastic. Oh, yeah, yeah, it, absolutely brilliant. And of course, I'd read that guy's books, the guy whose books that they're based on, the whole thing about interviewing him and he's six foot six or something. And he suddenly goes, he could kill me and the guards would never get here. And he's already yeah. in prison. But well, one thing um, my friend told me, because he was doing some sort of play about serial killers. And so he went and talked. I said, how could you not have told me? But the thing is, actually, Ed does the uh, does audiobooks. Mm-hmm. He does. He does a shit ton of audiobooks for for the blind. And I've I've looked and looked online to see if you can like locate like get those because like surely they would go for lots of money if you could get them outside of whatever distribution network they're in. Yeah. But I can't well, find I think them. Maybe maybe they don't advertise that. Probably. <laughs> but this little blind lady in Oklahoma, and she's like. Oh, what a nice, pleasant voice that young man has. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, he's a serial killer, you know. Killed his grandparents at 12. That could have been a clue. <laughs> no matter, the wonder is what mother was pissed off at him. But uh, Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to compliment you on the Venus complex because I really felt there's a there's a self-reflection in the character in the main character that it does remind me of Kemper. It reminds me of these serial killers that they know they know what they are and they've crafted this careful persona in which I thought it was interesting that his background was an art history professor as I've worked for a university and the level of misogyny amongst male professors is still, whether you want to admit to it or not, is still pretty prevalent. So mm-hmm. his, when I read his character, I was like, oh, this reminds me of far too many people than I need to, I care to admit. But mm-hmm. I, I just wanted to say that that was, there was a quality to him that I appreciated and uh, honestly probably caused the tingle up my spine the most because sometimes some of his some of his ways of thinking I was like oh I can see this and I've seen I've heard it similar things before so sorry I just wanted to take that moment oh thank you very much that that's really great I'm glad that you caught that I mean I you know a, a friend of mine said how could you have written such a misogynistic book but it's just it's like exploring a character I mean there's a there was a big hoo-ha about a woman who'd written the book from the viewpoint of a pedophile and it's like it's not that I feel sympathetic towards people but I also I've, I've wanted to know I've always been interested in psychology and I wanted to know what makes these people tick and through all my research and you know talking to you know policemen and psychologists and stuff like that you know and exploring stuff that I thought how would it be and it was sort of again being an actress you know putting yourself into that part it's like how you know how would I feel if I was a guy and I just was really frustrated and and it's interesting seeing I, I saw this thing that was on the daily show actually about the epidemic of rage and how anger and rage is almost like an addiction and this feeling of you know getting angry at somebody and you just see people the craziness that are going on planes and stuff and you think well the last 15 months has been hard on everybody but that i think with you know with certain men that colin wilson had a theory about this it was called the he wrote a book called the outsider he said you know of the it's not very nice about humans but he said you know about 90 percent of the population are just regular people and then you got 10 percent who have these feelings of i can do something i can do something I've got these feelings of power and blah, blah, blah. But only 2% of that population are intelligent enough to become the Einsteins and the scientists and the, you know, whatever you might think of them, Jeff Bezos, you know, masters of industry and stuff. And then you've got this sort of uneasy feeling of people who have these feelings of power and dominance, but no outlet, no art, no business sense. They're just angry and frustrated. And they just, you know, this is what builds up into you know and if you're a psychopath to boot you're in you know your neighbors are in trouble i think that's that's the problem there are what was it so i read this wonderful book about by a forensic psychologist and he said there's probably about 150,000 psychopaths walking around america as we speak but most of them are stockbrokers or doctors or journalists or lawyers or something (laughs) and very few of these tip into you know running around killing people but then there are those who run around and kill people and i think also as i explain in my book there's this this not that my serial killer uses guns but that that there is this kind of old west mentality of ah this is my right to do this where's my gun where's my this where's my that in the united states and i suppose that it does carry through throughout the world but and also you know, women aren't taking a lot of shit anymore. And that 
makes more rage and anger and you know frustration. We all know where that can lead to, as <laughs> right. Michael says. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm glad that, you know, I, I hit some things. I mean, there's a movie, by the way, that also is expresses that as well of that sort of male entitlement thing. I don't know if you guys have seen a film called American Mary by the Saskatoon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I mean, she is raped by her surgery professor or something, which is, you know, grotesque. She's a student and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, it, you're very much at the mercy of that kind of thing. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, I've had a few moments myself, but I'm the kind, because I also, along with mime, I also took Kung Fu, Kung Fu? Kung Fu <laughs> lessons, you know? And so when somebody tried to grab my, mm, you know, bottom, I just turned around and kicked them right in the, where it hurts. <laughs> and I was wearing silver two inch stiletto heels. That's what they deserve. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, I've had people say, you're so lucky they could have killed you or something. But I didn't even think, you know, and this is basically what my Kung Fu teacher taught me. He said, you just have to react. And if you react, you're going to do this. But one does have to be careful about what you react to. No, and it's all kind of grisly and horrible. And things aren't made better by short tempers and anger and polarization and, you know, by the politics making things and people getting killed over being asking someone to wear a mask and stuff like that i mean it's sort of beyond any psycho psychology class i ever took <laughs> but right. um, these are troubled times we are in the plague years you know i mean it, but it makes you know someone said oh doesn't this make you inspired and i was like going, actually no i'm just scared to death about yeah, it. terrified. <laughs> Barbie, I think I speak for us all and I say it's been a pleasure, but we do not want to make you late for dinner. That would be rude on our part. This is, hold on, I'm not hearing any stirring. So if we just want to wind up in the next five minutes. What's coming down the pipeline? What is the next big project? Okay, I've got three things in the pipe. One is I'm writing a screenplay and that's been languishing forever, but I really have to get it going. Of my short story, Zulu Zombies, which is from Rourke's Drift to Milton Keynes, it's um i don't know if any of you guys saw the film zulu with michael Caine. oh yes there was this um you know and it's basically zombie spirits from the the, the dead warriors zulu come to haunt a, uh, a descendant of the rourke's drift battle in london via milton Keynes and a ba- very bad train journey <laughs> for two girls and i'm working on that i'm working you know, we're still struggling to find fan- f- financing for Blue Eyes, the film that I'm doing with Chris Alexander. And also, I'm working on a secret project that I can't talk about. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. But it's really cool. And it's sort of based, it's it's in the Hellraiser universe kind of thing. But it's, it's based on my character, Sister Celise, that I created for the Hellbound Hearts Anthology. Actually, Hellbound Hearts Anthology. I mean, they were also in Voice of the Damned, but the Hellbound Hearts Anthology is still in print. So run down to Amazon and it, it's got wonderful stories from a bunch of people. They're all stories based on the Hellbound Heart. And I took my inspiration from the fact that in the Hellbound Heart, the lead scene, Cenobite was female. So my sister Celise is someone who actively decides to become a Cenobite. And yeah, yeah. But she's a nun. And I get to work out all my issues with the Catholic Church. <laughs> See, it's therapy for me writing, really, you know. So that's, that's it. I mean, it's been, oh, God. Oh, Doug, call it sick, but in delicious ways. Oh, great. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. So it's it's got the erotica in it that I can't seem to keep out of any of my stories. I don't know why it happens, but it does. I don't set out to do it. Oh, and I've got a short story coming out soon. And it's in a, damn, can you hold on a second? Sure. Because the, the title of the anthem, it's it's out on D-Main Books. And it's edited by Dean Drinkle. And it's all the stories are based on the Dante's Inferno, which is cool. But mine is like really, uh, it's, it's okay, I'm just trying to find out what the title is, because it's changed a couple of times. It could be City of Woe, Stories Inspired by Dante's Inferno, or Abandoned Hope, Nine Tales of Hell. And he doesn't answer my question there. So it's either, <laughs> but if you just put Dante's Inferno there, or just Barbie Wilde, because that, that'll... But this is, it's a really disgusting story, she said. <laughs> excellent, excellent. We love that. Oh, I, oh, but here's the thing. This is the difficulty. I was given lust. And because all my erotic stuff comes, it just comes in. It's not like I, I actually had a little bit of trouble. Hold on, lust. Hmm. 
But eventually, <laughs> I, did, I did come up with a story. It's short, but fully packed. Looking forward to that. So I think it, it will be coming out sometime in the autumn, I think, on Domain, Domain yeah. Publishing, Domain Books. I definitely have to pick up a copy of that. Yeah. yeah. But the other project is, a, is um, should I talk about it? Yeah. Well, when, yeah. It's fi- when it's more finished, it's been taking, it's a long time in the thing. But it's, it's, it's like I said, it revolves around my Cenobite character. For, from the Hell, Hellbound Hearts. So what you're saying is we're going to have to have you back on. We have to talk about this. <laughs> yes. The Star Trek special. Yeah. Oh, hey. Star Trek Twilight Zone special <laughs> with a little bit of horror. But I mean, I can't think. Of, I think these are all the things that I'm supposed to be doing. Sorry, I should have a list in front of me. But yes. Before we officially let you go, what's for dinner? It's uh, called a faux filet. It's a. It's kind of a steaky thing with delicious potatoes <laughs> in, in duck grease, but not too many. <laughs> and it's 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 a steak. It's it's. You know, sadly, I'm not. It's this. I I was talking to my doctor, and he said, "I hope you're getting enough iron." And I said, "Oh yes, we. I have steak at least once a week." And he went, "Excellent." So I thought, okay, that's not what they normally say. But yes, that's that's what I'm having, and it's it's going to be good. We have a very nice little red wine too. Well, Barbie, it's been a pleasure, and we'd love to have you back on. You have a great rest of your day. Oh well, you you know, you guys have a wonderful day. Thanks for for having me on your lovely show. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Good luck with everything. And everybody keep our chins up and keep safe. Likewise. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Barbie. Take Bye. care. Bye. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day all with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.